I love you today. It's good to see everybody here today. I hope you're having a blessed day. Um, I don't know if you know this or not. Today is a, I mentioned last week, last Sunday was a special day, a special anniversary. It was one year ago last Sunday that we physically moved, tangibly moved the things from the other church building to here. And it was exactly one year ago today, except a year ago it was July the 1st, but it's been exactly 52 weeks, 52 Sundays ago today that we had our first service here at, the, at this new location. And it's been a really good year, hasn't it? We've had a lot of good things that have happened, and uh, we're glad that all of you are here today. I want to uh, mention, I was talking a, a little bit ago to Debbie Jarvis, whose mother is uh, Joy Asbill, and of course you know Lynn, her other daughter. Uh, she's not doing very well, and uh, we need to be in prayer for her. She's having some problems remembering and uh, just getting elderly and with the things that go along with that. So make sure that you continue to remember, and I'm sure she would appreciate phone calls and visits and cards. That is uh, Joy Asbill and Lynn who lives with her. And then they kind of have a big compound out there where they all, they all kind of live together. So make sure that you remember her. Uh, I want everybody to remember tonight, we, this is a fifth Sunday, of course. There are four of these in a year. And we have a good tradition here to where we, we do have a service down here tonight, but I won't be here. It'll be a smaller service. Joe and Mike will conduct it. And if you choose to come down here, I'm sure it'll be good. But we really want to encourage people to meet with people in homes and just have a, a simple meal. Uh, we're having some people at our house tonight, and it's not going to be steak and lobster for those who are coming. Sorry. Uh, we're just going to have a simple meal. And the purpose is just to get to know each other and to build relationships with each other because that's what God wants in his church. I do have a very important announcement before I get into the message today. This is really important. I cannot overstress the importance of this announcement. If you have a child who is in the youth group right now, or you are a parent who has a child who is in the youth group, or if you have one who will be in the youth group in the next couple of years, we need you to be here next Sunday evening, July the 7th. During the evening service, we're going to be talking about the future of the youth ministry here. Just to give you a little heads up, uh, the reason Ken and Donetta and their family are not here today, they go out of town lots of times to visit family on the fifth Sunday. The elders and I talked with Ken on Sunday. It was a really good meeting. And uh, we uh, explained to him, and he is all in agreement with this, we want a full-time youth minister. And because he is a full-time teacher, uh, he does not want to give up his full-time teaching job. He is going to continue to remain here at the Landmark Church as our worship minister. But we are going to be hiring a full-time youth minister. And that is what we want to discuss next Sunday night. So, parents, I cannot stress to you enough, make sure that you are here next Sunday night. So let's go to God in prayer as we begin our message. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this Sunday, the first day of the week. This is the Lord's Day. Every day truly is your day. But this is a special day for us as Christians to gather together on the day of the week that you resurrected your son Jesus again from the dead and you gave us new life and you gave us hope for the future. And we're just grateful to have an opportunity like this to be able to sing songs of praise, of worship to you, to remember Jesus in a special way by remembering his death and his resurrection through the Lord's Supper and honoring you by opening your word and gaining instruction for it. We just pray that you will bless us today. We pray for the future of this church. We pray for what we've just mentioned about the future of the youth ministry in this church. The reason that we are going to be transitioning to a full-time youth minister is we value the kids in this church. We value their spiritual lives and their spiritual growth. And we just pray that you will bless us and truly guide us in everything that we do. We pray that all the parents, those who currently have kids in the youth group and those who will have the next couple of years, I pray that all will come and be ready next week to, to share and to have input into the future direction of this church. And we just pray for your guidance. And now as we open your word, we pray that you will help our hearts and our minds to be focused on what it says to us. 
Help us to learn, help us to grow, and help us to implement your principles. We pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. And the whole church said, Amen. Today is the last message on the great book of Job. book of Job is one of the great books of the Bible. If you are reading through our church reading schedule, recently you finished reading through the book of Job, and you're probably in Psalms or Proverbs right now. Job is a great, great book, and of course, the, one of the things that makes it very unique, it is the book in the Bible that discusses the problem of suffering. And Job has gone through a lot of suffering. And we've talked about a lot of things. I mean, he lost everything. He lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his ability to make income. He lost his, his health. He had sores from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Uh, his wife, even, he was having a strained relationship with his wife. And then, of course, you remember his three friends and then a fourth friend later. They came. And at first when they came, they did a great job. They came and they just were there with him to sympathize with him. But then they opened their mouth and they started questioning him and they started judging him and saying that they had knowledge that they really didn't have and they knew exactly why all this was happening. And Job, through all this, he begins to waffle quite a bit. He remains strong, but he does waffle quite a bit. You would too. I know I would. And he begins questioning God. God, why is all this happening? Speak to me. I dare you to speak. And for 37 straight chapters, Job's only 42 chapters long, for 37 chapters, God has not said one single word. Job has done a lot of talking. His three friends have done a lot of talking. And then the most arrogant one of all, the fourth younger friend named Elihu, he did a lot of talking. God, the one who knows everything, has not said a word until now. God is going to talk. And the fact of the matter is, God speaks out of a storm, the Bible says. And, you know, since this is a book about unjust suffering, when God finally does speak here in chapter 38 that we're going to begin looking at, when He finally does speak, what you would expect God to talk about is about why all this happened, what the purpose behind it was, because that is what all of us would like to know, isn't it? I mean, if this were happening to us, we would like to know. In fact, when things do happen to us down here now, don't you want to know why or what is the purpose behind all of it? And that is what you would expect God to answer. But the fact of the matter is he never answers Job's question. God is going to speak for several chapters in a row here. He is not going to say one single word about why Job suffered and what the purpose behind all of it was. And you might be asking, what is the point of all that? Well, the point of the book of Job is the fact that God does not answer those questions. In fact, God is going to start asking a bunch of questions. And the point for Job, and the point in the book of Job, and the point for us is the same. And you and I are going to learn a powerful lesson if we will also pay attention. And so God says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I'm going to question you, and you answer me. God says, You've been asking me all these questions. Okay. I've got some questions for you. And if you dare to take the time to count, which I'm a geek and I did, God is going to ask Job 77 questions. And as he asks Job those questions, Job is just going to sit there and go, uh, I have no idea. And the reason God is going to ask the questions is not because God wants to know the answer to the questions. God knows the answer to all these questions. He wants Job to come to the realization which he wants all of us to come to as well. That we are not nearly as smart as we think we are. We don't have nearly as much figured out as we think we do. And our great need is to depend on God. So God's going to start off and he says, okay, let me ask you some, few, some questions. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Job, were you there? Tell me if you understand. Who determined its dimensions? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone? You know, until fairly recent times, people throughout most of history thought that the earth was supported on the back of a giant tortoise or a giant serpent. 
Now we know better than that now, but do we really completely understand how the earth hangs on nothing? Which is what scripture said, which is exactly what is happening. I know scientists and astronomers have made a lot of observations and we've determined a lot of things, but do we know exactly how all of this works. Well, actually, no, we don't. And so Job is standing there just kind of dumbfounded. He thinks, I hope that's the last question. Oh, no, not even close. God continues. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Job, do you know how to do that? Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Job, do you know about how all the universe is put together and how about how this beautiful world is put together? Do you know about all that? How about the depths of the seas that he talks about right here? I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, I know we have some people who are pretty, pretty scientific in here. You know what the deepest spot in the ocean is? There's a place in the ocean called Challenger Deep. It is 36,200 feet deep. That's almost seven miles if you do the math on that. Job, do you know about that? Do you know about all those things? Do you know about all the dimensions of the earth? How about this? How, how would any of us answer this question? Do you know where the gates of death are located? You would be like me. Uh, you know, I have absolutely no idea. And it continues. Have you visited the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of hail? I read some articles this week about snow. As many snowflakes have fallen since the earth has been here, and however many of that is, I have no idea. Not very many around here. If you live in Minnesota, a lot, right? But no snowflake is exactly alike. They all have a very unique pattern. And exactly why that is and how that happens Scientists have some ideas, but do we actually know beyond the shadow of a doubt? No, we have no idea. Job, do you know about that? Uh, no, don't know about that. And then he says, who created a channel for the torrents of rain? Do you know about rain, Job? Who laid out the path for lightning? Who sends rain to satisfy the parched ground and makes the tender grass spring up? The reason God is asking him all this is this. Job, here you are daring to question me about how I run this universe. About all the morality that goes on. And you don't even know the simplest things about the most common occurrences such as rain and snow. And in fact, still even today, there's a lot of mysteries for us. We don't even know about the most common, simplest things that take place on this earth. I was talking earlier about the oceans. Did you know that even now, you know, there's a, there, I mentioned a place that's almost seven miles deep, Challenger Deep in the ocean. You know, we think we got everything figured out. Did you know even now that only 5% of the ocean floor has ever been mapped? We only know 5% of it. And 80% of the ocean, which covers 70% of the surface of the earth, 80% of the ocean is completely unknown to us. We don't even know what is really down there. And yet the ocean is what regulates the temperature of this earth. It is what provides for life on this earth. 50% of our oxygen comes from the ocean. Did you know that? There's microscop microscopic photoplankton, phytoplankton that gives off all this oxygen. There's so many things that we don't even know in our scientific age. And he's asking Job all these questions and he certainly didn't know. He had no idea. And God continues, he says, how about the laws of the heavens, Job? Do you know how all that works? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? God is saying, look, I know about all these things, and you can't even answer the most elementary ABCs about how this world works and how this universe works. And if you and I are honest with ourselves... You know, we really can't answer any of the questions nearly to the degree and nearly to the depth that we would like to have them answered as well. It's kind of like, uh, you might remember if you were in college, uh, I had some classes like this. The professor will be talking about something that's really deep and kind of over your head. And you kind of slunk down in your desk hoping that uh, the person in front of you will block your view and the professor won't see you. I kind of think that's what Job is going through right here. Please don't ask me any more questions. Oh, but God's not done. I'm not going to look at all 77 questions, but Job, you don't know about the physical universe? How about animals, Job? 
Do you know about animals? Do you really know about all the wild animal kingdom? Let me ask you some questions about that. The ostrich, he says, flaps her wings grandly, but they're no match for the feathers of the stork. God has deprived her of wisdom. He has given her no understanding, but whenever she jumps up to run, she passes the swiftest horse with its rider. I don't know if you know about this about an ostrich. Do you know an ostrich can run 40 miles an hour? And their wings, and they can do this for a long period of time. It's kind of widely known that a cheetah is the fastest animal on earth, but they can achieve those speeds of about 60 miles an hour only for short bursts of time. An ostrich can run 40 miles an hour for a long, long time. Job, do you know about the ostrich? And do you know about the wings of the ostrich? We've only discovered this recently. The ostrich ha has wings that work like the rudders on an airplane to where they can keep running the speed and they put their wings out to keep them on the ground. Job, do you know about that? Oh, well, no, I, you know, and he keeps on asking him. How about the hawk, Job? Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings toward the south? Let me tell you a little bit about a hawk. We talk about, I wish I could see like a hawk. I wish I could too. A hawk can see a rabbit two miles away. Two miles away. And I don't know if you know about the structure of the bones of birds, but God designed them very interestingly. There's no way that this could have just kind of accidentally developed over time. It has to be there right now or it doesn't work. The bones of a bird are different from the bones of human beings. The bones of birds are hollow and in fact, inside, there are air compartments in there that are connected to their lungs to give them extra oxygen for flying. And inside the wings of a hawk, specifically, there are arches to support the bone structure of a hawk. Because when a hawk comes down to get a mice or a rabbit or whatever it is, he pulls a lot of G's when he's doing this, a lot of gravitational force, and it would snap those bones if it were not for the unique stuck structure, the strength, the arch inside the bones of a hawk. And so God's asking Job, Job, do you know about all this stuff? And Job is just sitting there with his mouth open. He has no idea. And he starts asking him some more things. And these are animals. We don't even know what they are. Take a look at behemoth, which I made, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly? Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit together. Its bones are like tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. It is a prime example of God's handiwork, and only its creator can threaten it. Some have said, well, this is a hippopotamus, or this is an elephant. Some have even said it's a dinosaur. Could that be? Yeah, it could be. We don't know. We don't know what it is. But Job, if you can't even explain that, and this is under my control, only his creator can threaten it, and you're scared to death of it, and no one else can explain it, how dare you question me? And then he brings up another animal that we don't know what this is either. Can you catch Leviathan or put a hook on its nose around its jaw? Who can strip off its hide and who can penetrate its double layer of armor? Its scales are like rows of shields that are tightly sealed together. When it sneezes, it flashes light. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like stream from a pot heated over a burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shot out from its mouth. And a lot of people at this point would dismiss this. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Fire-breathing dragon, oh, that's ridiculous. Really? There's a beetle that exists on earth today called the bombardier beetle. It releases a chemical spray at 212 degrees Fahrenheit when threatened. I watched a short video of it this past week. And we all know about electric eels. Before anyone discovered those, they would have thought that was impossible. How about a firefly? If someone would have told you before we actually discovered them, there's a bug that its rear end lights up. <laughs> would you have believed that? In fact, if you talk to scientists, they have discovered lots of animals that have vacant cavities in their head and there are animals we know that produce methane flammable gases. You talk to a scientist, I've read lots of articles this week, I won't bore you with all the stuff, but they said, is it possible for there to be fire-breathing animals? Yes. And if the Bible said there was one, then guess what? I believe there was one. And it is scientifically possible. 
And the conclusion of all this, God says, no one is fierce enough to rouse it. He's talking about behemoth and leviathan, this creature that we don't even know what it is. Nobody can control that. Who then is able to stand against me? Job, you can't explain anything about the way the universe works. You can't even explain the simplest things that happen every day around the world, like rain and snow. You have no idea about any of these animals. How dare you call me on the carpet? Now, I want you to notice what Job's response to this is. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And you asked, who is this who obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things that I didn't understand, things that were too wonderful for me to know, and therefore I despise myself and I repent in dust and ashes. Job had the right response. And this is what is needed for everybody in order to come and know God. We need humility. You know what causes people not to submit to God? It's arrogance. I've got everything figured out. I don't need anybody else. I don't want to submit to anyone. Job has the exact right response. He says, you know, I spoke of things. I, I pre-spoke. I shouldn't have done that. I spoke of things that I didn't know. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. I humble myself and I submit myself to you. And the point of all this, and this is such a good little message here. Life is not about knowing all the answers, but it's about knowing God. We are never going to know all the answers to everything that happens down here. Why did these events transpire in your life? Why? And what was the purpose? You're not going to know all the answers to that. Not here and now. You're not going to know how the universe works. You're not going to know all that. But that is not what life is about. And this is so important because I know there's some of you in here right now. What is keeping you from submitting yourself to God is because you want answers to everything. You're just not going to have answers to everything down here. And that is not the point of life. The point of life is not about knowing all the answers. The point of life is about knowing God. And I love this verse. It says, after the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite. You remember this is one of Job's three friends who came to him. This is the oldest one which is why he's talking to him. <clears throat> and he said, I'm angry with you and your two friends. And here's why I'm angry with you. Because you have not spoken the truth about, my, about me as my servant Job has. And so now here's what I want you to do. I want you to take seven bulls and seven rams, and I want you to go to my servant Job, and I want you to sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. My servant Job, he will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer, and I will not deal with you according to your folly. Everybody listen to me. This is what we all need. All of us need a sacrifice offered on our behalf so that God will not deal with us according to our sins and according to our folly. Amen. You may not know that that is what you need, but that is what we need. You've heard me say this who knows how many times in the almost six years that I've been here. There is not a single person in this room who deserves to go to heaven. If I get what I deserve, which I certainly do not want, if I get what I deserve, I go to hell. That is what I deserve. Even after you are baptized, what do you still deserve? You deserve still to go to hell. But thank goodness, a sacrifice, not of bulls and rams, but a one-time perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross is what has covered my folly as long as you will submit to it like Job did. And humble yourself and admit, I don't know nearly what I thought I knew. God, what I need more than anything else is I need to know you, not know all the answers. And look at the result of this. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and he gave him twice as much as he had before. If you go and read the book of Job, it's going to mention, you remember all the camels and the donkeys and all the money and all that stuff that he had before? If you go read chapter 42, he gave him exactly twice as much. And remember, Job had seven sons and three daughters who died. He gives him another seven sons and three daughters in his old age. He gives him twice as much as everything and restores all his children to him. And you might say, 
This is a fairy tale ending. And they lived happily ever after, right? Listen to this little story I found this week. This is funny. There was a four year old little girl. She rushed into the kitchen. She was all excited about the story that she had just heard at daycare that day. It was about this beautiful young woman, the princess, who fell fast asleep. And along came a handsome prince who kissed her, and she suddenly awoke. And do you know what happened next? This little preschooler asked her mother. And why, yes, they lived happily ever after, the mom said. The preschooler says, oh, no, they got married. <laughs> Life does not always end happily ever after. And even when you're married, happily married, like I am, to one woman for 28 years almost, it's been mostly good. But there have been struggles. And life does not always work out perfectly, does it? The point of life is not about knowing all the answers. It's about knowing God, which is why I love this great verse where Jesus said, this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? It's not about knowing all the answers. Here's what eternal life is. That they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Life is about knowing not all the answers. It's about knowing God and his son Jesus Christ. I've told uh, this story many times, but some of you don't know. You, you assume, well, he's a preacher. He must have grown up in a, you know, a beaver cleaver, perfect family, and his family went to church and all that. They were real religious, and his father and grandfather and all that were Christians and preachers and all that. That's not my story. I was a nice guy when I was growing up. I made good grades. I was on the honor society and honor roll and all that stuff and, and never did any, you know, really bad stuff, at least that my you know, parents knew about. You know, never, uh, I wasn't a drinker. I, wasn't, I never did drugs or any, you know, none of that kind of stuff. I was a good kid. I was a good kid. But here's what I want everybody to know, and this might be your case right now. You can be a really good person and still be lost as a goose as my dad used to say, and that was my case. I was a nice guy, I was a good person, but I was not living my life for the Lord. Just because you're not out there doing a bunch of bad stuff, which I wasn't, doesn't mean you're still living your life for the Lord the way he wants you to. I knew some things, I knew some facts. I knew about God before I was converted to Jesus in 1981. I knew about God, but I didn't know God. Now there's a big difference. And there's some of you that may be in that situation as well. And the last thing that Job says, he said, You know, I'd only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. God, I knew some facts about you before, but now that you re revealed yourself to me, now I know you. And that's what life is really all about. Life is not about knowing all the answers. Life is about knowing God. And so I want to ask everybody in here a really serious question right now. I know that every Sunday there are people that gather together here and lots of people in here who are Christians and do know God. But I do know that there are people in this crowd every single week that are sprinkled throughout us who you know a lot about God, but you don't know God. And what we have seen today, what it takes to know God, it's not like you have to be a genius and know all the answers. When I was converted to Jesus just a couple of months before I graduated from high school back in 1981, I didn't know a whole bunch of stuff. In fact, I didn't know very many things. You don't have to know a whole bunch to become a Christian. You do have to humble yourself like Job did. You have to admit, you know, I can't save myself. I need outside help to save me. I need to submit myself to God. I knew a grand total of one verse of Scripture when I was converted to Jesus. And it was a really good one. Mark 16, 16. And let me tell you what that verse says. I memorized this back in March of 1981, and I've never forgotten it. I have not changed my mind at all, despite how much I've studied since that time. I have not changed my mind at all on this verse. This is the last thing that Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. Your last words would be really important, don't you think? 
All his apostles were gathered around him after Jesus has already been crucified and resurrected. Right before he's about to ascend into heaven, he has all the apostles gathered together. And he tells them, I want you, this is verse 15. In verse 15 he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And there's, here's what he says in verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he who disbelieves shall be condemned. I'll never forget a March evening in a hotel room in El Paso, Texas when I was on a track trip when one of the teenagers studying with me showed me that verse for the first time. I'd never seen that verse in my life, never heard it in my life. And it really struck me, and it still strikes me the same today. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Brothers and sisters, you have to have expert help to misunderstand that. And yet our world largely today says the direct opposite of what that says. Our world today says, he who believes and is saved shall be baptized. That is not what Jesus said. Baptism is when you humble yourself before God and you admit, I cannot save myself. I need to entrust myself to you. And there's some of you in here today who need to do that. You must have the sacrifice of Jesus to cover your sins. And that takes place at the point when you submit to God, humbling yourselves before Him, expressing your faith in Him in baptism. At that point, God forgives you of all your sins and you have come into a relationship with God at that point. And if that is what you need to do, I would just ask you, like what happened to me in 1981. When I first saw that verse, I did not tarry. There's another verse in the book of Acts that says, Why tarriest thou, to use the King James Version, Acts 22, verse 16. Why do you wait? What are you waiting for? Why are you delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, that verse in Acts 22, 16 says. If you have not yet submitted to yourself humbly and expressing your faith and trust in Jesus and repented of your sins and turned to Him in baptism, you don't know God. You might know about Him, you not, might know some facts about Him, but you're not in a relationship with Him. And God has provided everything for you and He wants you to be saved. And so if you need to respond today, maybe publicly or maybe not publicly, maybe you say, hey, I'm going to talk to you privately about this, Mike. That's great. I'm going to be at my office tomorrow at Denny's, 7.30 to 9 in the morning or longer than that. I have, have stayed there till almost noon, till the waitress has about kicked me out before. I'll stay there as long as you need to. And that's not the only time I'll talk with you. I'll talk with you anytime. You can call me anytime. You can email me. You can Facebook message me. You know, te I respond to text messages. All, don't tweet. You know, I'm not a tweeter yet. But all that other stuff, I'll be more than happy to sit down and talk with you and answer any question you have. Brothers and sisters, this is something you have to get right. Because none of us are right on our own. We have to be right by, by being made right by Jesus Christ. And so if you need to respond to the Lord now, we're giving you this opportunity. Let's all be standing together while we sing this song of invitation.